34-year-old Victoria Merton of Louisville, Kentucky, embodies an all-American spirit of adventure. But with her video camera rolling, her quest to push the limits of her own endurance nearly killed her. Normally, Tori is accustomed to racing on calmer water. But in October 1997, she was approached by Scepter, an Italian company known for its extreme no limits competition. The challenge? To be the first woman to row solo across an ocean. The proposition was intimidating. <coughs> to row the North Atlantic, uh, going west to east, is no cakewalk. On June 14th, Tori Merton took the first strokes in a 3,600-mile odyssey from North Carolina to France, aboard a 23-foot boat she named the American Pearl. I knew that, okay, the next three months, it's just me and this boat on this wide, wide piece of water. Yeah, uh, and uh, dessert for Tori packed 120 freeze-dried meals and a solar-powered desalinator providing fresh water. At the end of 58 days, Tori had rowed more than halfway across the Atlantic. But of all the obstacles she faced, none proved more menacing than the fury of the sea. I'd been through some pretty heavy storms and capsized three times. When Tori did capsize, the American broke was designed to right itself. And though terrified, her waterproof cabin kept her safe. A big wave would come over the top and it would spin the boat. And I'd be upside down for a couple of sections and the boat would rock and then it would eventually roll back upright. For inspiration, Tori kept a piece of home close by. That little flag on that boat took such a beating. And it was so comforting to look out on deck in the morning and see that flag still there. But the weather steadily worsened. And while we breathed a sigh of relief as Hurricane Danielle passed by the East Coast on September 5th, Tori was brutally engulfed by the storm. It says, after 11 hours and a severe shoulder injury, she called for help. It makes it sound as if I dropped my nail file overboard. <laughs> you know, the morning Hurricane Danielle arrived was September the 5th. The boat capsized five or six times. Now, you're thinking, particularly if you're faculty, you're thinking, was it five or was it six? 
<laughs> She's a university president. Can she not count to six? <laughs> if you're inside this cabin bouncing around like a ping pong ball, you can just see the ceiling going by. You don't actually get to count how many times it went by. <laughs> so after the fifth or sixth episode, I said, I can't take it anymore. I'm going to get out of my cabin, climb out of my watertight hatch, tie into my safety tether, crawl across the deck to get an emergency position indicating radio beacon. Otherwise known as an EPIR, it's a distress beacon. You turn it on, it says, help! You don't turn it on, it doesn't say anything. And the time it took me to get out there, waves were washing over the boat. It was doing this really annoying submarine thing. <laughs> when your ears pop because the boat has gone so far under the surface of the water, it's a bad sign. <laughs> and I realized, I, as I said in the video, I could not ask another human being to come out into that storm to get me. I chose to go onto the North Atlantic in a rowboat, and I had to take responsibility for that decision. So I tied the distress beak into my life vest, crawled back across the deck, I went through five or six more capsizes that day with the distress beacon tied to my life vest, not setting it off with my other hand. That was one of the hardest things I've ever done. The next day was September the 6th, lovely sunny day. I bailed the water out of my boat. It took me most of the day to bail the water out of my boat. I, um, I forgot to mention, two of my capsizes were end over end pitch poles. One capsize dislocated my shoulder, the next capsize put it back into place. <laughs> it's my personal definition of a bad day. <laughs> if you combine this with the fact that 10 years prior to that I had skied 750 miles across Antarctica to the South Pole, you will understand that as the president of Spalding, I will not decide whether or not our students get a snow day. <laughs> So September the 6th, I bail the water out of my boat. September the 7th, another hurricane named Earl passes well north of my position, but it triggers a number of freak waves. I capsize a number uh, four, about four more times, and I look out and I think the waves aren't nearly as big, the winds aren't nearly as strong, it's safe enough to ask for help. And at that point, I set off my distress beacon. I was picked up by a container ship named the Independent Spirit. You can't make that stuff up. <laughs> and I was taken to Philadelphia, and I returned to Louisville, Kentucky, the home of all great ocean rowers. <laughs> I worked for the mayor of Louisville. The mayor had to leave office because of a term limit. And I was offered a job working for the boxer Muhammad Ali. And it was in the time that I worked for Muhammad, and he said, Tori, you don't want to go through life as the woman who almost rowed across the ocean. And he was right. And as I studied Muhammad's life, I realized you don't get to be the world champion three times if you don't get knocked on your backside at least twice. And he understood even better than I did the need I had to get back up. So being a rower, I'm going to shift to the book now. Being a rower, I do everything backwards, so I'm going to read the last page first. I can prove I do things backwards because I went to divinity school and then I went to law school. <laughs> Usually people go to divinity school after law school to atone for their sins. <laughs> About a year after my successful row, Mac, who is my husband, and I had the good fortune to spend a few days with Thor Heyerdahl and his wife at a series of public events in Dijon, France. By that time, I had grown tired of talking about the trip. I thought if one more person asks me about a rowboat, I'm going to blow a gasket and fly around the room backward. With this as my frame of mind, it was an invaluable gift to watch Thor Heyerdahl answer question after question about his voyage across the Pacific, which he wrote about in the book Kantiki. He was in his mid-80s, and he had been answering these same questions for more than 50 years. He was unerringly gracious. I watched him answer the same questions over and over as if they were entirely new each time. At the end of a long day, I asked, so what's it like having your life defined by a balsa raft? He was quiet for a long moment. He seemed to study my face, and then he answered softly, if you didn't want to be known as the woman who rowed the boat, you shouldn't have rowed the boat. <laughs> His tone was not at all condescending. The words were spoken with tenderness and an understanding that took me completely by surprise. The following day I was standing with Mac when Thor Heyerdahl came with a question for me. Do you plan to write a book about your trip? I admitted that I had considered it. He looked at Mac and then he leaned in my direction and he said, be sure to leave room enough to grow. Many have asked why I waited so many years to write this book. It took me eight years. The simplest answer is that I had to get comfortable with my life defined by something as small as a rowboat before I could write about it and still leave room enough to grow. With that, I'll go to the first page.
In the end, I know I rode across the Atlantic to find my heart, but in the beginning, I wasn't aware that it was missing. In January of 1998, I asked my uncle, if I write a book about my exploration, should I write it as a comedy, a history, a tragedy, or a romance? With a twinkle in his eye, he said, a romance, it must be a romance. He explained that I was too young to write my life as a history. Who wants to read the history of half a life? Tragedy, he explained, was boring. Anyone over the age of 30 can write his or her life as a tear-soaked muddle. There's no challenge in that, my uncle counseled. Comedies are fine, but the greatest stories in life are about romance. I didn't doubt that my uncle spoke the truth, but there was a problem. I had no experience with romance. None. I was 35. When I talk to teenagers, I just go, loser. <laughs> Tragedy I could write. Comedy I could write, even history I could write, but romance was out of my depth. If I had charted a map of my life, I would have placed romance on the far side of an unexplored ocean where ships would drop off the edge of the world and the legend at the edge of the map would read, here there be sea monsters. <laughs> I considered myself a thoroughly modern woman. As a graduate of Smith College, I embraced the notion that our culture had evolved to a point where a woman might openly take on the role of an Odysseus. Like the epic hero in Homer's Odyssey, women could be clever. We could set out on epic quests of our own choosing. Like men, we could be independent and internally motivated. Women could be tested and not found wanting in trials of courage, resourcefulness, endurance, strength, and even solitude. What I didn't know is that exploring these vaguely masculine qualities would not be enough for me. I am, after all, a woman. It was not until my boat dropped off the edge of the world into the realm of sea monsters that I began to understand some of what I had been missing. So at the end of the book, I'm married. At the beginning of the book, I have no experience with romance. And in the middle, there's a lot of rowing and rowing and rowing alone in a boat in the middle of the ocean. Talk about looking for love in all the wrong places. <laughs> So, because I have no experience with romance, all the opening chapters are a blend of comedy, history, tragedy. Comedy, history, tragedy. Now, the comedy is easy. My life is hysterically funny. The history, I'm a student of history, so history naturally wanders into the book from time to time. And tragedies, I think my uncle's right. I think anyone over the age of 30 can write his or her life as a tear-soaked model. Um, there's nothing special about me in my tragedies. We all have them. Um, but they come into the book to sort of explain some of the forks in the road of my life. And the romance is at the very end of the book. So for those who haven't read it, if we were going to, you know, indulge in gender stereotypes, guys tend to really like the first four-fifths of the book when it's the adventure. And they hate the end, which is the romance. And the women tend to, you know, can take or leave all that rowboat stuff. But they, when they get to Mac at the end of the book, they think that's, that's fabulous. Now, I think of the parts where I am flirting with my husband, or the man who is now my husband, as the comic elements in the book. I think they're the funniest parts. I'm going to read a section that I think of as comedy. Some people think it's tragic, but I'll read a section that I think of as comedy. Um, it's early on in my first trip. I had hoped to surf the Gulf Stream, a warm water current that flows toward Europe. And if I had been able to get my boat in the Gulf Stream and stay in the Gulf Stream, I think it would be a very fast west to east journey. I got into the Gulf Stream, and uh, eight days from the start, I lost communications. And when I lost communications, no one could say, here's where the Gulf Stream is. I got blown north of the Gulf Stream into an adverse current pushing me back toward the United States. And I never established firm contact with the Gulf Stream after that, and the boat just stopped. By late afternoon, I had rowed my hands bloody trying to beat the countercurrent. The Gulf Stream was 46 nautical miles to the east. Each hour I rowed the equivalent of four and a half nautical miles forward, while the current pushed me two and a quarter miles back. It would take 20 hours of nonstop rowing to reach the Gulf Stream. If I stopped rowing, the adverse current would carry me in the wrong direction. For the first time in the trip, I wondered, what am I doing here? Any person who leaves the comfort of civilization is destined to ask this question from time to time. Still, asking it so early in the trip struck me as a lapse in mental fortitude. <laughs> Don't let the have you ever people win. The have you ever people are the mall muffins of the spectator society. Have you ever been alone on the ocean, they ask? No. Have you ever been alone on the ocean at night? No. <laughs> have you ever been alone on the ocean at night in the dark? 
<laughs> the penchant for redundancy among the have you ever people is enormously irritating. How are we human beings to progress without testing our limits or going beyond what is known? We must prefer risk over stalemate. Why are we supposed to be afraid of the dark? People die from hunger, from cold, from injury and illness. But what peril is there in the sun going down? It is an interior darkness, a darkness of mind that is deadly, not the dark of night. Reporter, so are you crazy? Tori, probably, aren't we all? <laughs> Reporter, was there some trauma in your childhood that makes you want to do this? <laughs> Tori, as a girl, I wasn't allowed to play baseball and I never got over it. <laughs> Reporter, are you an adrenaline junkie? Tori, you try rowing every day for 12, every day, 12 hours a day for three months and see how much adrenaline you get out of it. <laughs> Reporter, if you aren't going to get any money out of this, are you after fame? Tori, can you name the first woman to climb Mount Everest? Reporter, silence. <laughs> Tori, her name was Yonko Tabe. Can you name the first woman to ski to the North Pole? Reporter, silence. Tori, her name was Anne Bancroft. Can you name the first woman to ski to the South Pole? Reporter, silence. A woman named Shirley Metz and I were the first women to ski to the geographical South Pole. We touched the pole at the same time so we could each claim to have been the first. Have you ever heard of either of us? Reporter, a silent shrug. Tori, men occasionally garner fame out of expeditions. Women do not. Men are sometimes rewarded for their rugged individualism. Women are not. When a woman is too robust or too independent, she gets asked what her boyfriend thinks about it. No one. No one genuinely cares what the boyfriend thinks. They just want to know whether or not she has a boyfriend. <laughs> Reporter, well, okay then. Tori, okay then. <laughs> so with that, I will take your questions, and I promise I won't be that snide. <laughs> Really, honest, I won't be that snide. <laughs> yes? Would you agree or disagree with the following statement? Um, with some young people uh, completing a four-year college education with excellence is the equivalent of what you did in your rowboat. Absolutely. The question is, would I agree or disagree that for some people, for some young people completing, or older people, completing a four-year college degree is the equivalent of rowing a boat across the ocean. I think that's absolutely true. I think each and every one of us has an ocean to cross. I hope, just for boredom's sake, that you don't literally have to row across an ocean. Um, as I'll talk about later, most women do not have to row a boat across an ocean to figure out what it was I was trying to figure out. Um, I was trying to figure out that maybe love and friendship were good things. All right, idiot. I had to row across the ocean because I was a slow learner. <laughs> but we all have oceans to cross. And for many people, a college degree is a huge ocean. It is filled with uncertainty. It is filled with adversity. Um, it's filled with student loans. It's filled with all sorts of things. And while college and university life is meant to be physically safe, it is not supposed to be intellectually safe. It is supposed to intellectually challenge you. It's supposed to push you over the edge. It's supposed to have you climb back up out of the abyss. And so I absolutely agree that um, it, it is a grand adventure. Yes? What did you think when was, uh, the whales or the uh, sharks came up? Yeah, there was this uh, one day, the question is, what did I think when the whales or the sharks were coming up beside me? So one day I was rowing along, and I smelled this really sour, fishy smell, and I thought, whew, I need a bath. <laughs> and the plumbing system aboard the American Pearl was bucket and chuck it. And I had two buckets. I had a red bucket, which was the bathroom bucket, and I had a green bucket, which was the laundry bucket, and I did not confuse the two. <laughs> and about every third day, I would make an extra gallon of water, and I'd take a bath. And I was wrong. I smelled it again, this really sour, fishy smell. I, I really need a bath. It was kind of a rough day. Waves were washing into the boat. And then I looked down, and what appeared to be a parking lot surfaced next to my starboard gunnel. It was a sperm whale. And the sour, fishy smell I had been smelling was whale breath. <laughs> they have some nasty breath, I got to tell you. And it, it surfaced six inches from my starboard gunnel and just hovered. 
and then it drifted out and swam slowly away. And I pulled in my starboard oar because I was afraid I'd touch it and it might touch me back. <laughs> um, but it was an extraordinary experience. It knew exactly where I was and uh, never touched me. And I, I thought about how much respect that creature gave me as he was eyeing the boat or she was eyeing the boat and uh, how little thought we give to them. So it was extraordinary. Yes? After reviewing your videotape, did you ever find any segments where you must have had some sleep deprivation or something like that? Hey, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, did you experience any of that? Because solitary, solitary confinement is a punishment for a reason. Right. And uh, we do lots of funny things when we're out by ourselves and lack of sleep. Yeah, folks asked if I um, if I talked to myself, and then the 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 film uh, Castaway came out after my row, and I've had reporters say, "Did you have a volleyball that you talked to?" <laughs> <laughs> and I said, "Well, I didn't have a volleyball, but I had taped the portraits of 13 presidents to the ceiling." And there were lots of conversations I had with those presidents. The, the, the first really intriguing uh, conversation was during my first set of, my first really big storm with boats flipping upside down. And I've already been seasick. And uh, the, the first time I was seasick, I managed to throw up outside the hatch. The second time, I was about to open the hatch when this immense wave came and hit the boat. And I threw up on the hatch, and it came back into my lap. Not a very dignified moment. And so the hatch part of the front part of the cabin smelled really bad, so I put my head in the back part of the cabin. Boat flips upside down, and I find myself face to face with Franklin Delano Roosevelt. <laughs> we have nothing to fear but fear itself. <laughs> Nameless, unreasoning terror. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, I'm scared, okay? <laughs> and. and uh, and months later, I, I was rowing along, and it was kind of like that same kind of rough day that the whale came to visit, and water kept washing into the boat and hitting me, washing into the boat hitting me. <laughs> I just lost my temper. I picked up my bucket and chuck it bucket, and I scooped up some water, and I threw it at the ocean, and I scooped up the water, and I threw it. Take that, take that, take that. And I felt ever so much better. <laughs> and I went to bed that night, and I'm lying there, and Thomas Jefferson was right over my pillow. And I imagine Thomas Jefferson saying, what did you do today? <laughs> and I said, I went rowing. And I threw water at the ocean. <laughs> and I could imagine um, Theodore Roosevelt responding, my dear, we all throw water at the ocean. Some of us, some of us think it's very serious business. <laughs> yes? Two questions. How dark was it then? How well did you sleep? I mean, did you set a alarm clock or what? I mean, that would be awesome. There are two questions. How dark was it and how well did I sleep? Uh, there were nights when it was dark. And um, the, fortunately for the folks who um, read my book, I had a lovely uh, editor who said, Tori, you had to row across the ocean twice. Your reader does not. <laughs> and so I had this full treatment of the first row and the interlude between the first row and the second row and a full treatment of the second row. And it was easy to write that second row because I had kept a video, an email log. It would, today it would be a blog, but then there was no such thing as a blog that I sent out every day. And so I had lots of written material on that second voyage. And one of those evenings started, it was a dark and stormy night. <laughs> and I said, cliche, yes, but it was a dark and stormy night. And when there wasn't a moon, it was incredibly dark and bleak. But I want to read to you um, uh, another, another passage here when it was uh, nighttime. Actually, I like this passage because uh, a woman came up to me one evening and said, you shouldn't have put this passage in the book. It makes women seem weak and feeble. It's like, I rode a boat across the ocean. Do you think I'm worried about being seen as weak or feeble? <laughs> but, uh, oh, wrong one. Here's the passage. As I cooked dinner that evening, a food wrapper blew out of my hand and flew to the far corner of the bow. I grumbled after it. As I reached out to pick it up, I noticed the wrapper was stuck to something large and moist, and that that something was looking at me. 
The creature was a foot long, white and slimy, with a purple tinge around its edges. A dead squid. I did what any reasonable woman would do. I ran. <laughs> Two running steps carried me from the bow bulkhead to the stern cockpit where I sat down to compose myself. That's disgusting! I could handle a dead rabbit, a dead bird, even a dead horse, but a dead squid. Yuck! It must have been trapped there when the boat capsized. Maybe the boat will capsize again and it'll go away. <laughs> Tori, get a grip. No slippery dead thing is worth another capsize. The situation made me think about the mayor of Louisville, Jerry Abramson. That gets big laughs in Louisville. <laughs> the mayor is a fastidious fellow and during the time I worked in his office, I made an effort to dress myself appropriately. Finding stylish shoes in a size 12 had always been a problem. One afternoon I was walking beside the mayor, he looked down at my feet and noted, got your lizard skin shoes on today. My shoes weren't lizard skin, they weren't even leather, but one didn't quibble with the mayor. Yes sir, staying on top of things. Then the mayor turned to a nearby police officer and said, she probably killed the lizards with her bare hands. <laughs> Dead squid, I'm not touching that thing. <laughs> that night as I was sleeping, I imagined I could hear the squid whimpering from the other end of the boat. <laughs> About 3.30 a.m., a loud groan woke me, and I realized it was only the squawking of the rudder lines in their pipes. Wide awake, I slipped into my life vest and went out onto the deck to employ the bucket. When I looked up, Carl, Carl Sagan's voice from the television series Cosmos echoed in my mind. Billions and billions of stars. Actually, apparently he never actually said billions and billions, but it was so parody. Billions and billions of stars. And to that moment, I had no earthly concept of what billions and billions actually looked like. The moon had retired for the evening, but the Milky Way painted a highway of light across the night. I couldn't find the major constellations because there were too many stars. I faced north to look for Polaris, the North Star. Ordinarily, the Big Dipper would point the way. I saw billions and billions of stars. Similarly, Draco and Cassiopeia were lost in a sea of sparklers. I turned toward the east and southeast to look for Venus and Jupiter. Instead of these two nearby planets, I saw billions and billions of stars. Ordinarily, I could find Vega in the west, but that night it was as indistinguishable as a single grain of sand on a beach. I rinsed the bucket overboard, and a cloud of phosphorescent light filled the water beside my boat. I rinsed the bucket again and watched the water sparkle as if it contained a thousand lightning bugs. Three dolphins arrived. As they leapt into the air and splashed back into the water, flames of phosphorescence trailed their powerful flukes. I couldn't see the dolphins underwater, but I could track them by the squiggles of light that sparkled in their underwater wakes. The dolphins circled the boat several times before swimming off toward the south. In a speech I had written for the mayor of Louisville, I'd used the phrase, a rainbow of excellence that lights the cosmic dark. The mayor had said the line was too hyperbolic. As I knelt on deck, encircled by the celestial illumination of the stars above and the bioluminescent plankton in the sea below, the hyperbole no longer seemed exaggerated. I reached overboard and swirled the ocean with my hand until stirred the ocean with my hand until the swirls of light flowed from my fingertips. So here I am, alone, on the ocean, at night, in the dark. Lucky me, without darkness, one cannot see the stars. Uh, I'm actually ashamed that Peter Gomes um, isn't one of the mentors mentioned in my book. Because uh, with each of the chapters in the blend of comedy, history, tragedy, there's also usually a friend, a mentor, or coach, someone who comes and picks me up off the floor from whatever tragedy it was I've just written about. And there are a number of mentors that come into the book. And Peter Gomes was a professor at the Harvard Divinity School, and he was an astoundingly good professor. And I remember this tremendous crisis of conscience I had. I was working with homeless people in South Boston, and there had been a terrible fight, and um, two gentlemen got into a knife fight, and being the kind of woman I am, I stormed right into the middle of it, and uh, got kicked across the jaw and was cut. And it took forever for the ambulance to come, because it was in a dangerous part of town. And when I left to go back to Harvard, I had this bloody towel tossed over my shoulder. Now this is before AIDS was a big deal, but I made it all the way through the T, most of the way through Harvard, you know, Harvard Square, into Harvard Yard, this bloody towel over my shoulder, half conscious that it was there, half daring someone to, you know, say something about it. 
and I was walking past Memorial Church when Peter Gomes walked out and he was like, okay, kid, tell me about this. <laughs> and I described this sense of, you know, the, the, the subway in Boston being this Alice in Wonderland tunnel. And I would go out into this urban jungle, this urban wilderness, and face terrible things or complete unconsciousness of people living on the street, children living on the street. And then I come back to the ultimate ivory tower with a, you know, endowment the size of m most GDPs of major countries and with surrounded by privilege. And I was just at war with the faculty and it was Peter Gomes who sort of set things straight. And his question was, I, this is a lot of time for Peter. Um, he said, if you have five minutes to spend with someone, and you can spend it with a homeless person, or you can spend it with a king, with whom you, would you spend your five minutes? And being the woman I was, I would spend it with a homeless person. And Peter said, then you're an idiot. <laughs> and his explanation was, if you spend five minutes with a king, you can help every homeless person. And it was things like that that would knock me back on my heels. Uh, so, yes. Um, can you talk a little bit about um, your motivation initially to, to sail, to challenge yourself, um, really resulted from a sense of helplessness. And can you right. really talk about that a, a bit? Because I think people would be surprised to know that that was your motivation. Right. Um, the question is about hel helplessness. And um, in some ways, the book is almost a rewrite of the Moby Dick tale. Uh, I, Ahab was out to kill the white whale. I was out to kill my own sense of helplessness. And my life had really been a balance between the urban adventure, which I think all the important things happen in what we laughingly call civilization. The pick and shovel work required to make a difference here is what matters. And the backcountry adventure for me was just recharging and exercising different muscles and learning the persistence, the endurance, the resourcefulness required to make a difference in this world. And I was always sort of bouncing back and forth. So I'd work with homeless people and then I'd go climb a mountain so I wouldn't feel helpless again. And I would work as a hospital chaplain and then I'd ski to the South Pole so I wouldn't feel helpless again. And that sense of helplessness grew out of having grown up with a mentally handicapped brother. And I thought, well, if I could just ski across this continent or row across this ocean, I'll be bigger and stronger and smarter and faster and I'll always be able to help the people in front of me who need my help. And that was idiotic. And I will end with a passage that where I sort of catch on to what an idiotic thing that was. But let me read to you, since the Peter Gomes question, let me read to you about two of these mentors that I talk about. Um, I kept writing a really bad book over and over and over again. And it wasn't until mentors came into the book that it felt like a, a decent book. I did a Master's of Fine Arts in Writing at Spalding. And my editor had said, Tori, you're writing this book as a man would write it. What's interesting is you're not a man. You need to go back and write this book as a woman would write it. And I was like, well, is that like running like a girl? How do you write like a woman? I don't, how, how, do, how do I do that? I don't know. And so I end up in this program, and the woman who runs the program, Sina Naslin, is this Merlin-like character, and she goes, with whom would you like to work as your, with your, with, work with, as your first mentor? And your mentor is your faculty member. And I named all the manly men who worked in the program. Bob Finch or Roy Hoffman and blah, blah, blah. She said, Molly Peacock. I think Molly Peacock would be a good mentor for you. Molly Peacock is a Canadian poet who entirely fits her name. She wears scarves and pastels. And the only thing she said in the first residency that stuck in my mind was luxury. I love luxury. <laughs> Rowboats, Molly Peacock. So I sent her my first 50 pages of wind and wave and nuts and bolts and solar panels into salinators and my second 50 pages of epoxy and plywood and she writes back she goes okay now I understand all this stuff about wind and waves and nuts and bolts but were you on this boat? <laughs> I was like Mo Molly I'm really not very interesting and you think the nuts and the bolts are interesting? <laughs> so I had to put myself in the boat my second mentor was a woman named Elaine Orr Orr Orr's okay she's from Chapel Hill North Carolina and she said, what are you working on? I said, I'm working on a manuscript about taking a rowboat alone across the ocean. She goes, you mean sailboat. I was like, no, actually, I mean rowboat. Whatever. 
<laughs> first 50 pages, wind and wave and nuts and bolts, me. Second 50 pages, wind and wave and nuts and bolts. She writes back, she says, let me get this straight. You actually took a rowboat across the Atlantic Ocean? I was like, uh-huh. What messed you up? What twisted you? What pushed you over the edge? Where did you come from? As if Mars might have been the answer. So she wanted me to write about every tragedy. Open a vein, hemorrhage on the page. <laughs> I get to my third mentor, Robert Finch, who edited the Norton Anthology of Nature Writing, very button-down character, Robert Finch. And I send him wind and wave and nuts and bolts and me and where I came from and bleeding all over the page. And he's like, I don't care. I don't want to know about you. I don't want to know where you came from. Tell me about the wildlife. I want to know about the wildlife. <laughs> so the whales and the dolphins came into the story and the sea turtle that came and visited and passed me. It was cathartic writing about that sea turtle passing me. <laughs> Racing the sea turtle and losing. <laughs> you know. And my fourth mentor was a guy named Charles Gaines. Charles Gaines is a manly man. He takes off the entire month of November to go hunting in Newfoundland. He wrote the book Pumping Iron, worked with Arnold Schwarzenegger. He's a guy, right? What are you working on? I'm working on a manuscript about taking a boat alone across the ocean. Cool. <laughs> so I send him wind and wave and nuts and bolts and me and where I came from and whales and dolphins. He's like, whoa, kid, let me tell you a secret. This is called an adventure story. Nobody wants depth in an adventure story. They want the swashbuckling tale of daring do. They don't want all this other information. So I put in a little more swash and a little more buckle. And now I have a thousand pages of manuscript. And I wanted the book to be read by high school, college age folks. If it's more than 250 pages, you're doomed. <laughs> So I get to my last mentor, um, a guy named Roy Hoffman, and he said, tell me a story. And the story that I needed to tell, I needed to explain why a woman would row a boat across an ocean. And it was about this battle with helplessness. It was about this need to try to make myself bigger and stronger and smarter. And if I just get one more academic degree, I won't feel helpless anymore. If I just do one more athletic feat, I won't feel helpless anymore. And, Ugh. Yeah, mm -hmm. finally I figured it out. But I'm going to read to you about two mentors, and then I'm going to finish up with my moment of epiphany when I figure out what this helplessness thing is all about. So I'm in the middle of the ocean, I'm having a bad day, and I need someone to blame, right? That's what we do. We're human beings. We blame people when we're having a bad day. This is all Rita Benson's fault. I met Rita Benson in 1981 during my first year at Smith College. I was strolling through the athletic complex when this grand dame who had taught at the college for more than 40 years placed herself directly in my path and said, hello. I straightened my back, squared my shoulders and answered, yes ma'am. This response was not unusual. Generations of Smith women had snapped to attention at Miss Benson's feet. Her steely blue eyes looked through me. When the measuring stick of her mind had finished sizing me up, she said, you will row. I answered, yes ma'am. In the spring of 1982, I learned to row on Paradise Pond in the center of the Smith College campus. Under Miss Benson's tutelage, I progressed quickly. As I was shoving off the dock my first day in a racing single, Miss Benson explained what was going to happen. I know you, she said. You will row up and down in front of the dock here. You'll row easily and you'll do just fine. Yes, Miss Benson. Then you'll decide to row around behind Paradise Island where no one can see you. You will take three hard strokes and the boat will turn over. No, Miss Benson, I'll take it very easily. Right, said Miss Benson. True to Miss Benson's words, I rode up and down in front of the dock for about 45 minutes. The boat was 26 feet long, but only 12 inches wide at the water line. If I sneezed in the wrong direction, it would turn over. Still, I felt as if I was getting the hang of it. And then Miss Benson went inside the boathouse to take a telephone call. I rode around behind Paradise Island. <laughs> I took three hard strokes. The boat turned over. It was, I think we ran out of batteries. It was early March in New England and the water was so cold that when I surfaced I had to talk myself into breathing. By the time I managed to get back into the boat and row it back around the island, Miss Benson was standing on the dock. Water dripped from my hair and clothing. Seeing me, Miss Benson smiled knowingly and said, and now what are you going to do? <laughs> I'm going to do whatever you tell me to do, Miss Benson. <laughs> This uh, second story is um, a little less humorous, a little more poignant. 
It was the fall of 1986. The Master of Divinity program at Harvard was a three-year program that took the vast majority of students four years to complete. In addition to three full years of academic work, two years of field education were required. The school discouraged first-year students from beginning their field education, but I was in a rush. I went to the field education coordinator, Sister Mary Hennessy, and I demanded a field assignment. Give me the toughest placement in the city. She gave me Boston City Hospital and she made the prediction, you will not last three weeks. I'm not sure which was more pivotal, the difficult assignment or the dire prediction. Either way, I was determined to finish the year at Boston City Hospital. PCH was a grubby place where the vast majority of patients were uninsured. Bill Lesh, the supervisor of chaplaincy, explained, the way you tell the doctors from the visitors is that doctors never make eye contact. Other students from Harvard came and went, but endeavoring to prove Sister Hennessy wrong, I stayed. Bill Lesh assigned me to cover three wards, an oncology ward, a psychogeriatric ward, and an orthopedic ward that soon became the first unit in Massachusetts for patients with AIDS. Brimming with youth and enthusiasm, I managed to get thrown up on twice in my first week. I lost the white tab to my clerical collar in the washing machine. Unwilling to admit my error, I resorted to using a folded over 3x5 card in my collar. <laughs> the 3x5 cards came in handy for taking notes between patients. On the oncology ward, a nurse introduced me to a patient named Joseph Curran. Joe was a perfectly rational, highly educated Jesuit priest who had lost many of his essential organs to cancer. I felt like a pretender as I stood at the foot of Joe's bed. The bright-eyed skeleton before me spoke, I want to die. I stood there, dancing on the verge of panic, until the skeleton spoke again, I'd like some water. I bolted from the room, filled a glass with water, and stall walked back to Joe's bedside. Later, the nurses would give me trouble for having taken water to a patient without permission, but Joe was grateful. Joe would return that favor a thousand times over. His body had betrayed him, but his vibrant mind was ever faithful. He had been a teacher and the fountain of his wisdom flowed freely for me. We both knew that I would be his last student. Joe was my Merlin. In our several months together, Joe transformed a wobbly kneed young woman into a passable hospital chaplain. When I doubted my adequacy, Joe would chide, you can't travel the road to wisdom in a feather bed. When I needed advice, Joe would close his eyes and recite long passages from Shakespeare or this one from George Bernard Shaw. Quote, this is the true joy in life, being used for a purpose recognized by yourself as a mighty one, being thoroughly worn out before you are thrown on the scrap heap, being a force of nature instead of a feverish, selfless little clod of ailments and grievances complaining to the world that it will not devote itself to making you happy. One afternoon, Joe asked, what is it that drives you? Without thinking, I answered, my brother Lamar. I explained that my brother was developmentally disabled. Mother said I got all his brains. And you feel guilty about that, Joe asked. No, I feel guilty because I wasn't always able to protect him. <coughs> Joe smiled. Guilt, the gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> Your brother isn't here, so you find others who need protection. Who protects you? I wanted to say that I didn't need protection, but it wasn't true. If I told him that I didn't deserve protection, he would ask more questions. So I turned to the books. What shall it be today? Richard II, Act Three, Scene Two, skip to where Scroop enters. Withered and grizzled by illness, Joe was not much to look at, but the tenderness in his eyes provided safe refuge. As time went by, Joe taught me to see beyond myself. He challenged me to venture unrehearsed into rooms of pain. There were so many rooms. I watched a three-year-old boy die from diarrhea. I told shattered parents that their teenage children were dead. They heard only solitary words, alcohol, car, accident, truck, dead. That last word always had an echo. I stayed with geriatric patients, watching them drool away the last of themselves. I stood vigil over the corpse of the homeless man who froze on a street corner during rush hour. The smell of gangrene became familiar as it seeped from gunshot wound after gunshot wound after gunshot wound. At the end of one unendurable day, I fled to Joe's room. He was asleep. I sat quietly in the chair beside his bed. Minutes later, about the time the tears began to roll into my collar, Joe's eyes fluttered open. Turning toward me, he whispered, come here. I leaned my face closer to his. Close your eyes. With eyes closed, I felt Joe's bony fingers brush the hair past my ear. 
When his hand eased lower to cradle my jaw, I became uneasy and shot him a sharp and wary glare. Joe responded with a light chuckle. Steady now. As his other hand emerged with a tissue, I closed my eyes again and felt Joe wiping away my tears. You must let your heart be broken by the things that break the heart of God. I was a dutiful student, but this lesson was too advanced for me. I thought I understood. Having perfect faith in my own understanding was the chief folly of my youth. My heart was breaking. God's heart was breaking. These things anyone could understand. But being at ease with this brokenness, being okay with it, seemed like surrendering to helplessness. This I could not do. The lesson was too advanced for me. So I'm going to wrap up with one final passage. It's in my second row, and I'm... I'm rowing along, and I'm, pre I'm pretty happy because it looks like I'm going to set a new record for the fastest solo crossing. Not the fastest solo crossing for a woman, the fastest solo crossing, period. It looks like I'm going to break the record by a week. And I get a telephone call from Diane Stagge in Louisville, Kentucky, the home of all great ocean rowers. <laughs> and she said, I had four redundant communication systems on the second row. I've gotten for 78 days in that first row without communications. And she said, Tori, there's a ha, ha, there's a ha, there's a hurricane in the Caribbean, and it seems to be heading in your direction. I was like, no, 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 time out. I only have one virtue. I actually do my homework. I had studied hurricanes. No hurricane in recorded history had ever traveled west to east at the latitude of the Caribbean. Why not? Because the trade winds blow east to west. The trade winds have blown from east to west for all of recorded history. You can leave the coast of Africa in a barrel, you will get to the Caribbean. <laughs> because the trade winds will blow you there. <laughs> hurricane Lenny was the first hurricane in recorded history. <laughs> To travel a thousand miles west to east, it came directly over my boat. I was not happy about it. So I'm in the middle of that storm. As you can see, it's very near the end of the book. I'm lucky because it's exactly how it happened in real life. Oops. Hours passed. In the cabin, I began to feel like some wild creature trapped in a corner. Over time, a suffocating sense of helplessness filled the air. It whispered to me, you aren't going to make it. You'll fail. You'll fail again. You will lose and helplessness will win. I had come back out onto the ocean intending to kill forever my sense of helplessness. Suddenly, I was furious. The time had come for me to slay the dragon. To hell with this storm, I said, and to the helplessness in my cabin, I said, to hell with you. That's the only swearing in the book, I swear. <laughs> I strapped my life vest on and scrambled out into the storm. A wave came over the boat as I clipped my tether into the safety cable. Blind to the insanity of my actions, I stood tall and defiant on the deck. The dark sky swirled like water running down a drain. Lightning crackled blue and purple. In my rage, I thought of Lamar and the blue and purple of our bruises. I remembered with searing vividness the times I had failed to safeguard my brother and the times I had failed to protect the many others who had come after him. I had learned a speech from Shakespeare's King Lear. I had shouted it for fun during snowstorms in the Antarctic, and I'd used it to entertain friends in the midst of rain-soaked rowing races. This time, I did not play at the madness of King Lear. I was the madness. Blow wind and crack your cheeks. Rage blow, you cataracts and hurricane spout. I do the whole speech in the book. I will spare you that. <laughs> I had been gearing up for this fight since I was a teenager. I outroared the wind. I dared the ocean to swap me down. I conjured the wrath of nature, but this was not enough for me. I turned my anger toward God. It isn't fair for you to keep putting helplessness in my path, I bellowed. A wave slapped the boat hard, but I stood firm. I've never taken the easy way, not once. What do you want from me? I called God by all the proper names the Harvard Divinity School had taught me. Adonai, Allah, Brahmin, Elohim. What am I supposed to do? Krishna, Marduk, Odin, Shanti. What do you want from me? Shiva, Vishnu, Yahweh, here I am. My voice turned raspy and I switched to shouting at the lesser gods of wind, sea, and storm. Adad, Donar, Dylan, Indra, come on, Neptune, Raman, Rudra, Thor, and Yam. Suddenly I felt silly and self-conscious. <laughs> Yam was a Phoenician god of the sea, but I couldn't help but think of the vegetable. <laughs> Here I am. 
am standing out in a storm picking a fight with a potato. <laughs> Part of me wanted to laugh. No, I'm angry. Yam rhymes with, in the next instant, I found myself swearing at the sky. My exercise in blasphemy, blasphemy didn't last long. It wasn't that I lacked the audacity to swear at God. I just couldn't come up with that many swear words. <laughs> a bolt of lightning struck the cabin behind me and I fell to my knees. I've helped the disabled. I've pulled homeless people out of dumpsters. I've comforted individuals in distress. I put myself out there time and again. How much more do you want from me? How much more can I give? I had been so sure that rowing across the ocean was a part of my path, I had almost taken it as a calling. Had I been wrong? Had it been nothing more than an exercise in haughtiness and self-delusion? Was this not mine to do? My fury was spent. I stayed on my knees and begged God's forgiveness. A tall wave washed over the deck, submerging me for a few seconds. I didn't move. As the water cleared, I began a long series of apologies. I'm sorry that I've been too small, too weak, too self-absorbed to make a difference. My arms and legs shook with shame. I'm sorry that I've not always been able to protect the people who have needed my protection. Tears streamed down my face as I began to name all the people I'd let down. My brother Lamar was the first name on the list, but many others followed. The sorrow and disappointment poured out of me. After dozens of memories, I ran out of names. Over and over, I apologized for my helplessness. When I looked up from my prayer, the storm seemed to shine blue with electrical energy. It was then that I realized a sublime truth of what I had been missing. I had intended to slay the sea monster of my helplessness, but I am, after all, a woman. Goody. I am, after all, a woman. We don't slay our dragons, we embrace them. Helplessness was not something outside of me, some malevolent force I had to defeat. Helplessness was a part of me. I am a human being. It is our brokenness, our helplessness, which makes us human. I thought I'd been trying to earn God's forgiveness, but the forgiveness I needed was my own. I had only to forgive myself. I thought that rowing across the ocean would make me stronger, wiser, less susceptible to the vicissitudes of human existence. What I didn't realize is that rowing across the ocean would not make me any less human. I needed to accept my dragons. I needed to make peace with my helplessness. Still on my knees, I prayed a prayer of thanksgiving. It was a prayer of atonement, atonement at one mint. I no longer felt alone. I felt at one with nature, with the storm, with myself, and with the rest of humanity. In that sense of oneness, I felt a stronger love than anything I'd ever experienced. It was as if I could feel the good wishes of friends back home. I could feel the prayers of all the people who were hoping I would weather the storm. Our helplessness makes us human. Love is what makes our humanity bearable. If there was to be any salvation for me, it would come through the redeeming gift of love. I remembered my uncle's words, a romance. The greatest stories in life are about romance. So it was the very next day that I called up Mac McClure from my rowboat and I asked him to marry me. <coughs> Not very ladylike, but that's how it happened. <laughs> and Mac, oh. Mac, being the guy that he is, he said, sure, why not? <laughs> so for those of you who are students, good luck on your journey. For those of you who are faculty, good luck helping others in their journey. And when you leave Carl Sandburg in the evening, I know that you will go back and you will teach, you will heal, you will feed, you will build. You will inform, advocate, comfort, guide. You will criticize, organize, contribute, and in a thousand other ways, serve people and causes. Because we are all rowing boats across oceans. Thank you.